Thank you very much, Mike, and to every one of you for uh, coming out on a rainy evening to hear something on a topic that, you know, for a speaker you've never heard before, on a topic that you might not have heard of before. So that says more about you, I think, than it does about me. Tonight I want to tell you part of the story of an idea that has been very popular in the United States since the 19th century, since the middle of the 19th century, but is actually an older idea than that, as you will see. I'm even going to connect it with Mr. Jefferson. Um, and so you'll see this idea in various forms uh, tonight. What you're looking at in the opening slide is a very popular work of fiction from the 1890s. One of the best, work, most popular works of fiction from that period. The problem is that the author didn't intend this to be a fictional work at the time he wrote it. Um, the author, Andrew Dixon White, whom I will show you an image of a little bit later, was the first president of Cornell University, founding president. He and the philanthropist Ezra Cornell, for whom the school is named, were fast friends. They had very similar liberal religious visions, and they also wanted to create a university that would be free from ties to any specific religious body, the first such university in the state of New York, similar to Mr. Jefferson's plans for UVA here, a uh, very similar idea. It was a result of a political fight, as we shall see, um, in which it, it came about over the land-grant universities, and you know what they are because you're at one. Um, your university dates from 1872. Cornell was just a few years earlier, but it, the same piece of federal legislation that created VPI also created Cornell. Even today, Cornell is an odd duck on the university landscape because it has a private piece and a public piece. The public piece where you pay public, school, public state tuition is, you know, the ag school and some other things. The private piece is the rest, which is, you know, Ivy League level uh, tuition. Uh, so it, I'm, I don't know of any other institution like that. Perhaps there is one, but nothing comes to mind. The title of his work summarizes his lifelong theme. He wrote a history of what he believed to be warfare or conflict between two social forces, if you will. Science, one of them, and what you're thinking of science is what he thought of it. He had a similar vision of what science means. And theology. Theology, of course, within, um, within uh, Christianity or within Judaism, theology means the syst systematic ways of thinking about one's belief in God. That's basically what it means. So how do you organize your belief system in kind of a structure? It's inspired really by Greek philosophy, efforts to do this. Just as the Greek philosophers did certain things in systematic ways, so through the history of Christianity, Theologians have wanted to do things in systematic ways that were ultimately rooted in Greek philosophy. And so that's what theology means. Um, theology, an example of a doctrine in theology for Christians would be the Trinity, the idea that God is, uh, is in three types of persons and manifestations within the Christian tradition, or the belief that, that um, uh, Jesus died for one's sins. Uh, that would be an example of a theological belief. Christendom refers to the whole area of the world that has been, in which Christianity was the dominant culture. In White's sense, White was trained in early modern European history in Germany. He was actually a student of the famous historian von Ranke in Germany. White was a student of early modern history, including the Reformation. And he meant, by Christendom, he basically meant the history of Europe and North America with regard to beliefs about God and their relationship with science. That's really, that's a mouthful, but that's what he meant. So that's, that's the, the big picture. And he believed there was ongoing, inevitable, perpetual conflict between, not between religion, not with religion, White himself considered himself to be religious and he thought religion properly defined was really good, but between Christian theology, 
and science. That was his version of the conflict view. That historically there's never been a positive interaction between Christian theology and science, and there really can't be in principle. Any time theology is involved in the conversation with science, it has one role, holds back scientific progress. That's his view. And he presents that view at great length in these two volumes, which really constitute a big doorstopper of a volume. And this was a bestseller when it came out in 1896. And it, 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 is, um, it has been reprinted many, many, many times subsequently. Here's a, the next image will give you a sense of where it went down very well, who really liked this book. This particular cartoon comes from a magazine long defunct, a magazine called Puck, P-U-C-K, that was uh, edited by a man named Udo Kepler, who was an artist, and this is his image, basically, of White's ideas. And it, it's three years after his book itself came out. What you see is a group of liberal clergy over here. Every one of these people is identified by a little label on their lapel that's difficult perhaps for you to see. You can see, for example, this one here. It shows pretty well. I'm not going to identify any of them for you except one, the man on the machine gun. He actually looks like Andrew Dixon White, but it isn't Andrew Dixon White. This is actually the very liberal Jewish thinker Felix Adler, who is the founder of the Ethical Culture Society in New York which starts the Ethical Culture School, whose most famous alumnus undoubtedly was J. Robert Oppenheimer, the physicist who worked with, with uh, the Manhattan Project, who ran the Manhattan Project, essentially, ran the scientific side of the Manhattan Project during World War II. The gun says history, archaeology, evolution, enlightenment, and geology. That's what it says on each of the barrels. And the boxes are rational religion, historical facts, and scientific facts. And these liberal clergy, the other, the other, the other five people here, are all Protestant clergy or a uni, and a Unitarian. Um, and they're under this banner, think or be damned. And it's their searchlight that's illuminating the darkness over here. And the people coming out of the darkness are all unidentified uh, conservative clergy and under the label, believe or be damned. And the castle they're emerging from is medieval dogmatism. In the late 19th century, many professional historians thought of the medieval period as, quote, the dark ages. It's a term that if you know, you're familiar with history today, historians today don't use that term for some very good reasons that I won't have time to elaborate on here. Um, but medieval dogmatism, the combination of words, the two, the two word term, was a, really, was a pejorative term in White's opinion. He uses it that way in his book. Medieval means backward, unthinking, and dogmatism is a word often used in theology. The word dogma, which derives from the Latin verb to teach, simply means a teaching, a teaching. Now, in White's view, a dogma is something that a theologian could believe without any evidence. It's not something a scientist could believe. So scientists are never dogmatic in White's view. Even though in his, historically lots of scientists are dogmatic about various things, White doesn't think that that's an appropriate kind of word to use in that context. So he paints a black and white picture here in full color. <laughs> now, to just jump down to today for a minute. Many people today believe that science and Christianity inevitably conflict and that this has always been the normal situation in the past. It's a very popular cultural belief. In the United States, it would be this type of religion, Christianity. Some other cultures, it might be something different. I know of quite a few people in Islamic countries who would say the same thing about Islam. Um, that's not my topic tonight. The most famous person in this category is probably Richard Dawkins, um, whom, as many of you know, was a a zoologist at Oxford for much of his career. He's now retired from that position. Toward the end of his career, he became, an, he had, took an endowed professorship that was newly created at Oxford. The professorship was for the public dissemination of scientific knowledge. And he was, he's an eminent science writer. He writes brilliantly about aspects of biology and other sciences. But then he often likes to tread into other areas, especially into writing anti-religious things, such as this book, The God Delusion, 
Um, most of his books have sold well over a million copies, I think, including this one. Incidentally, the person who endowed that position at Oxford was one of Microsoft co-founders, Charles Simony. And Charles Simony is an anti-religious atheist. I know many atheists myself who are not anti-religious, including my best friend from graduate school. I've described him in that way because I believe that adequately describes his attitude toward these issues. And Richard Dawkins ends up in that position, which is interesting. He no longer got that chair. He's retired from that now. Someone else has it. I'm, I think it's a mathematician or a mathematical physicist. In the United States, perhaps the most famous modern exponent of a view similar to White's was Carl Sagan. Now, if you're, if you're in the current generation of university students, you might not know who Sagan was, but still you might. So I'm just, I'm just curious. Please show a hand if you know who Sagan was. Yeah, you do tend to be more of my generation. In the 1970s and 80s, he was almost certainly the most famous scientist in the world. And not because he was a top-notch scientist. He was a good scientist, perfectly good scientist, a planetary scientist at Cornell. But he wasn't in the category of, say, um, the people who were just named in the last few weeks to be Nobel Prize winners. Um, he was, he was an, a, an important scientist in his field. But his fame didn't come from that. His fame came from the works he wrote for public dissemination, um, such as this one, The Demon Haunted World. His vision is that science is a light in the dark. And the dark includes all forms of traditional religion. It doesn't matter what it is. That includes that. And so science can help light the dark. And religion is a form of superstition, in his opinion. Most famously, he proposed these ideas in this book, which is based on a television series of, I think it may have been 13 weeks, close to that that was on PBS uh, back around the time I was a college student. And this is also was shown in many public high schools on 16 millimeter film that you'd put in a projector in those days. You can buy it in DVD form today, so you can still obtain this. And the series made many, many claims about science and also many, many claims about religion and the interaction of science and religion, which he felt like white was always a case where religion's always holding back scientific progress and doing bad, th religion people are doing bad things to scientists and to science. That was his vision of this. Perhaps his most famous illustration of this is the so-called um, medieval gap. Um, say, this comes right from Cosmos, this image. Uh, it's a timeline showing that for about a thousand years in the ancient world, Science flourished in a Greek context and then a Greco-Roman context. And then in his view, in Sagan's view, Christians destroyed the Ale library at Alexandria and murdered the mathematician Hypatia. And then after that, for a thousand years, nothing happens. Nothing happens in science until the revival of things in the Renaissance down here. So that was his view. You can see it in a nutshell here. And he uses, of course, the term dark ages uh, the onset of that, and then a thousand years of darkness. And science can light be the candle that lights up this dark period. He doesn't really tell you that a lot of the people in the bottom of the list are Christians. They were. Uh, and he doesn't tell you at all that there's a lot of advances in the Middle Ages, including the invention of the university that is still here, um, and things like that. I'm not going to go into that tonight in any detail. But there's a lot left out here, needless to say. Sagan, Sagan was an amateurish historian. I mean, he wasn't an historian. You know, he didn't have training in history. Um, he, uh, he had training in other fields. But he did a lot of popularizing of the history of science, especially the history of science and religion. Uh, and it's, 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 shall we say, not passing grade stuff that he did in his books on these topics. He went way out of his area of competence. And he literally wrote about things he didn't understand what he was talking about. He wouldn't have done that in his scientific work, of course, but he did it in his cultural work. That film series Cosmos was revived not too many years ago by Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is indeed one of the most famous science popularizers in the world. Tyson channels Carl Sagan. Uh, back when he was a young man, in fact, he made the journey to Ithaca, New York, to introduce himself to Carl Sagan because he admired Sagan so much. He sees himself doing the same thing in a modernized version and, of course, chooses the same title. A further connection is, you notice the writer 
the executive producer and writer, Ann Druyan, she was Carl Sagan's third wife. And she scripted the first series, Cosmos, as well, along with two other people, her husband and another person, who scripted that. So the, the connection is very obvious. So if you've seen any of these films, you know you get a sense of this science, light, and the darkness type of picture from Sagan or from Neil deGrasse Tyson. And you get the same thing from Andrew Dixon White 100 years ago, 120 years ago almost now. And you also find the same thing here in Thomas Jefferson. Um, if you look at Jefferson's history of religion in Virginia, the section of, on religion in Notes on the State of Virginia, you find a very interesting sentence that I'm going to pull out in context. And here it is. Look at this. Galileo was sent to the Inquisition for affirming that the Earth was a sphere. The government had declared it to be as flat as a trencher. As I tell you here, that's what a trencher was. And Galileo was obliged to abjure his error. Well, when Jefferson was writing this, he thought everybody knew that everybody in Galileo's day, which was the early 1600s, believed the world is flat. That's what Jefferson clearly believed, making this particular statement. And indeed, he connects that directly with the Roman Catholic Church through his reference to this. Now, Galileo was indeed brought before the Inquisition. There was a big deal there. It had nothing to do with the spherical shape of the Earth. It had to do with the motion of the Earth, entirely different matter. I mean, I can talk about that afterward if you want. I'm not going to go into that in any detail right now. But this is historically, this is a laugher. This is really a laugher. Um, nothing like this, nothing like this happened. I'll come back to the spherical issue of the Earth later. I will deal directly with that and historicize that for you. Um, but this just indicates what Jefferson was trying to do here. He's trying to promote a particular ideological agenda and in this case, it's an anti-Catholic agenda, an agenda that's shared by a lot of Americans in the 18th and then in the 19th century, uh, particularly. Now, here's Andrew Dixon White. He is undoubtedly the most famous promoter of this particular idea. He was enormously influential for generations. Many of the best scholars believed that White had given them gospel truth in his book. What caused him to do this, to write a book like this on this subject? Indeed, to make it his lifelong work. Because as we'll see shortly, his work began on this topic in the 1860s. And he, he repeatedly returned to this theme and kept expanding it. And the two-volume work I showed you at the start isn't published until 1896. So this is his leitmotif, you might say. If, he were, if, he were a, if this were a great musical work, that's what it would be. And he, the Cornell connection is relevant here because, as you probably know from being VPI students, what happened to create land-grant universities was a piece of federal government legislation during the Civil War. And that gave states resources in the form of land that had been owned by the federal government, gave states resources either to take existing institutions of higher education and alter the, add to the curriculum, supplement to the curriculum with practical disciplines like engineering and agriculture, or to create new institutions to do the same thing. And they left, the federal government leaves that up to the states to decide how to do that individually. And so basically here's what happens, you know, you have this influx of resources in the state of New York in the case of Cornell. And when any monies of any magnitude come into a state legislature, you know what usually happens. There's a bit of a political fight about what to do with these monies. Already in New York State, there's a whole bunch of small liberal arts colleges that, that predate the Civil War. They were all controlled by one Christian denomination or another, as indeed were almost all American higher education institutions before the Civil War. You know, UVA was a significant exception. But nearly all colleges uh, that existed at that time had a strong religious identity still at the time of the Civil War. And so here in New York, it happens that White, who has just returned to the state, he has a famous, influential, wealthy father, 
and he's returned to that state from having been a professor of history at University of Michigan. He gets himself elected to the Senate of New York and he's appointed the chair of the Committee on Education because of his experience. And so he's able to kind of run the show when this money comes in. After a couple of failed attempts to take the money and give it to a very small technical type schools in New York that just fall flat, what then happens is the, the, it's reopened for what we're going to do with it. And the denominational colleges, quite understandably, want to get their share of this pie. And so there's a very big fight at the legislative level, and White ultimately wins after a whole lot of name-calling, infighting, and turning a few people who are sort of maybe on the other side of it into his allies. And, that's what, and one of those people is Ezra Cornell. And so that's who then pledges a lot of money to help them do this. So White wins this fight. He, throughout this conflict, he had made an issue of the fact that he wanted a different kind of institution in New York. He wanted an institution that was not under any sectarian control, and he called it an asylum for science, is what he called it, a place where science can be taught without clerical interference. Now, White reviewed himself as a kind of liberal Christian. He didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. He didn't believe in the deity of Jesus, but he believed that Christian morality was true and very important in the American nation for our future as well as for the past. He basically summed it up in love your neighbor and love God, which of course are teachings Jesus makes based on Jewish tradition. And so he thinks that's good religion and we ought to promote that. So he actually has a chapel at Cornell, but it's never done in a sectarian way. So this is what he en we end up with. So as a result of this political fight, where White has maintained the view that, in fact, Christian education is almost an oxymoron. That's basically his viewpoint at this time. He decides, after he's done with Cornell, getting it started, to get back at his enemies. This is what he tells Ezra Cornell. I'm going to get back at my enemies. I'm paraphrasing him here. I'm going to get back at my enemies for having done this, for having opposed all this so strongly. So he gets his chance. He gets his chance in 1869 when he is invited to give the first lecture of a series of lectures in New York City on science. He's not a scientist, but he gets invited to start the series off as this famous professor and founder of this brand new university that's dedicated to making this an asylum for science. And so he gets this platform, and this is the platform. The platform is the Great Hall of Cooper Union in New York City. It is still there today. This is in Lower Manhattan, not too far from Wall Street or NYU. And it's Abraham Lincoln had given a campaign speech there leading up to the campaign in 1860, to the election of 1860, not long before the Civil War started. This is an image from that event. I show it to you just to contextualize this. This was a big venue, an important place. And White gets to start off that series, and that's what he does with a lecture called The Battlefields of Science. That's what it is. And in that lecture, he says, he tells his audience, he's going to give them an outline of the sacred struggles for the liberty of science, a struggle which has been going on for so many centuries. Pardon me a second. So what does he tell people more specifically? Well, it, a lot. But here are three tidbits that he gives you involving huge figures in the history of science and the history of knowledge in general. Okay? So here is the first. The audience learns that Magellan had somehow proved the Earth to be round. You may have heard this in your elementary school teaching, that Magellan proves the Earth to be round when he circumnavigates the globe. This was still common mythology when I was a student in the 1960s in elementary and middle school. And then that was still a common thing when my children were in middle school in the 1990s, this idea. Even though the fact is every university educated European of the 15th and 16th centuries knows the Earth is round. And they have a pretty good idea how big it is. I'll show you that later. I'll give you the evidence for this. 
Second statement involves Nicholas Copernicus, who was the founder of the solar system, as you probably know. And he was also a canon, C-A-N-O-N, a canon in the Roman Catholic Church. He was a paper pusher, basically, and um, organizer for his uncle, who was the Bishop of Varmia in what is now Poland. Uh, and Copernicus um, had this career and slowly worked on his new theories of the universe, the essence of which was known for about 40 years, because Copernicus himself basically sent out tweets around 1513 uh, alerting people to what he was thinking about, and it took 40 years for him eventually to finish the full book, for many reasons that I won't divulge right now. He, White tells his group that Copernicus had escaped persecution only by death. <laughs> what he means by that is Copernicus's book was printed in the last year of his life, and it is literally true, as far as we know from sources who knew him really well, that the first copies of the full book, basically, the front part of the book gets printed last at that time, and the first pages of that, the very first part of the book, after all the rest has come in, are blade in his hands on the day he dies. And we don't even know if he recognized what it was because he had had a severe stroke six months earlier, paralyzed on the right side, further declines, he was comatose at the time these pages are placed in his hands. Okay, so that's the story of his death. And for 40 years, the Roman Catholic Church, officials of the church, going up as high as the Vatican, have been urging him to discuss his nominal, uh, novel ideas and publish them, publish them. Finally, a couple of his friends, the neighboring bishop and a Lutheran mathematician from Wittenberg, from Luther's Wittenberg, persuade him he's got to do this. This is his Christian duty to out these ideas, and he does. He's afraid of ridicule public ridicule, because anybody who thinks the earth moves in the 16th century is, off, is basically certifiably crazy. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're saying that in, your, in this room right now, for example, we're all going faster than anyone has ever gone in their life unless you've been a, jet fighter, a fighter pilot. Um, you know, you're going, about, you're going more than 600 miles an hour right now in your seat, just as the earth spins around its sun. And if we were closer to the equator, it'd be about 1,000 miles an hour and let alone moving around the sun at about 100 times that fast. So, you know, if you believe that, there's a bridge in Brooklyn I'd like to sell you. And so this is, this is just an idea that is literally incredible in the 16th century. And hardly anybody believes it for at least 75 years that this, is, that this could be true. But that's what Copernicus is thinking. And the third idea that I'll pick out of his lecture to give you this as a sample of the rest involves the most famous anatomist of the 16th century, the Belgian anatomist Andreas Vesalius. Vesalius is an anatomist at Padua in Italy, the greatest of the medical schools at the time. He is famous for revolutionizing medical education, not by introducing dissection, as White apparently thought, but by changing the way in which dissection is used in medical schools. It becomes the heart of the medical education for Vesalius. And the human body comes to replace the books of the great Galen and medieval commentaries on Galen, which are the, the great medical tradition then. And Vesalius indeed says, what we really need to study is this true book of ours, the human body, man himself, he says. And that's what's revolutionary about Vesalius. Not that he dissects. He's been dissecting his whole life. He started out as a young man as a dissector. And people have been doing it at universities in Italy for 200 years at this point. And it spread to other places like Montpellier in France and many other places. So dissection is commonplace in 16th century universities, medical schools. It's not new. But here's what White tells you about it. He says, dissection of the human body was thought akin to sacrilege, is what White says. It's just garbage. So that's the kind of information that White is disseminating in that lecture. Similar stuff later on in the book, just a lot more of it. Now another person from the same period, another American involved in similar ideas, was also a New Yorker, transplanted originally from England, but he spent most of his adult life in America, including I think in, may have been in Virginia, don't quote me on that, some of the time. Um, John William Draper. In, in the sciences, he's most famous for being the first person to take a photograph of the moon. 
Um, but he was a chemist at NYU who mid-career stops really doing research in chemistry and starts writing histories. He writes an intellectual history of Europe, for example, and then he writes this book, History of the Conflict of Religion and Science. Now, if it sounds like you've already heard that title, you almost have, but this one's from the 1870s, and White's is from the 1890s. The narratives differ in some ways. Draper is especially concerned to combat Catholicism. He's vitriolic anti-Catholic. White's concerns are a bit broader than that, shall we say. Um, but taking out of the preface of this book one full sentence that illustrates his book as a whole. I mean, after all, the preface is where an author lays out what they're going to tell you. So it's fair to pull one sentence out of the preface to indicate where he's going. And here he is. The history of science is not a mere record of isolated discoveries. It's not just one thing after another. It is a narrative, it is a story of the conflict of two contending powers. And he says one of these powers is this, the expansive force of the human intellect. That's where he puts science and reason. And the compression, that is the holding back, arising from what he calls traditionary faith and human interest on the other. And that's, of course, where he puts religion. So in his case, religion primarily means Catholicism, but it can also mean some types of Protestantism. Um, whereas in White's piece, it's theology. It's Christian beliefs. It's theology. White is very keen to let his readers know that he thinks religion is very good and very important. But Christian theology is bad and always holding back progress. OK, so what's going on in this scene? You recognize this? The, the scene depicted in this work. This is a work of American art. It is from the 1840s. It's by Peter Rothermel. And you'll find it today in the Smithsonian Museum of American Art. That's in Washington, but not on the mall. It's a couple blocks north of the mall. All devoted to American art. One, the first time I saw this painting, there was a docent from the museum in front of the painting describing to people what it was about. And the docent was as clueless as White was about the history of the, of, of, of the Earth's sphericity and all that issue. Um, but here you have the standard story, as taught to my children in the 1990s in their textbooks and in school, as taught to me when I was an elementary school child back in the 1960s. The story being that Columbus has this brilliant idea of cutting out the middlemen in Italy and the Middle East, of going all the way to the Indies by sailing west. And he's trying to persuade Western Mediterranean nations to pick up, to pick up on this. I mean, the Portuguese turned him down, for example. But you know, the Spanish government is kind of his last appeal here. And he tries to persuade Ferdinand and Isabella. And you see Isabella right here, Ferdinand and Isabella, to invest in this venture. And, you know, give it a shot. Well, Columbus happens to believe that the Earth is about 18,000 miles in circumference. He also happens to believe that Asia is much larger than it is. And so he thinks it is 3,000 miles due west from Spain to Japan. That's what Columbus thinks. The limit of a state-of-the-art voyage in the, 16th, in the 15th century. Might be able to make it that far and come back alive. So this is what he is really wanting to do. According to this painting, however, and the tradition that the painting represents, Columbus has to persuade the queen that the world is actually round so that he can make this venture. Everybody else thinks it's flat and you're going to fall off if you go too far. You probably heard that. Again, for my benefit, who actually did hear this in their education somewhere? I certainly did. We're, we're making progress. This idea is no longer, as far as I can tell, in current middle school books. But it was throughout the 20th century. Okay? It's totally bogus, as we'll see. Um, so this Draper, Draper of these two people, John William Draper, the chemist guy, he helped spread this myth of Columbus and the flat earth, this particular story. You know, stories like this have great appeal to people. You know, good guys and bad guys, and, and the good guy wins out in the end, this kind of thing. Triumphs over ignorance and superstition. In the version that, 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 that Draper has, that's how it's presented. That, there is, that the, the crown in Spain relies on the advice from a theological faculty at the University of Salamanca, which is the oldest university in Spain, 
who throw scripture verses in Columbus's face about why the earth can't be round. That's the version that, that Draper presents to people. And then Magellan eventually proves it's round by making it all the way around. Well, really, the earliest American source I'm aware of of the story is indeed a writer of stories, short stories especially, and it's Washington Irving. Now, I don't know how many of you recognize Washington Irving in your generation today, but I bet you do recognize Ichabod Crane or Rip Van Winkle, okay? That's Washington Irving. And among his other books, Washington Irving writes this massive four-volume biography of Columbus, which Irving is aware of is a little bit fictitious as well as a little bit factual. You know, you could call it a piece of historical fiction, perhaps. And it's published in, it's written in English, but it's published in Paris. He's living in Europe at the time. And he's been researching these things. He knows more than he lets on to in the book in terms of the way he does things. He knowingly puts into the book some stories that are, shall we say, fabrications. And the most famous one is this. He, he illustrated here, he believes that, uh, he tells readers that Columbus had to dispute against this council of learned theologians again, who were quoting the scripture and quoting Augustine against his voyage because the earth can't be round. It's got to be flat according to the Bible and according to the church authorities. That's the version that Washington Irving spins. And it's very similar to the version that you might find on cartoons today. Popular cartoons. I mean, like, you know, kids' cartoons. And also in school books, I say through the 20th century in the United States, you'd find this type of story. Well, Take a look at this picture now. Can you recognize what this is in the picture? This is a picture from a science textbook. It's a picture from what is probably the most widely used science textbook in the history of the world, in fact. It's a textbook that was written in the 1200s by a British monk who taught mathematics at Paris. His name was John of Sacrobosco. That's what he was known as, John of Sacrobosco. This version you're looking at, this image comes from a printed version of Sacrobosco because you can't print Sacrobosco until after Gutenberg. So it's used as a textbook in manuscript form for two centuries. And then, as soon as the printing press comes in, they start printing Sacrobosco as a textbook. This is not the first printed edition, Sacrobosco. This is the earliest printed edition that I've been able to look at myself. And this is the 1488 Venice edition. I chose 1488 on purpose as a pre-Columban date to help make this point. Because I think everyone in the room probably knows when Columbus made his first voyage, right? Tell me. Say so you know. And so this is four years earlier. That's the Earth. And this is illustrating people standing at four points on the Earth and how the stars overhead at night are different for them. Aristotle knew that in the fourth century BC. Aristotle also knew that the Earth's shadow in a lunar eclipse is round. And so the Greeks knew in the 300s BC that the Earth is round. Aristotle gave arguments for that. And the opening section of Sacrobosco's book does the same thing. It tells readers the Earth is round. And then later on, it will go on to discuss other aspects of the Earth. So contrary to what people have often been taught, the Earth's spherical shape and approximate size have been widely known since the time of Christ. That's just true. That's a fact, historically. It is also a fact that you can't find anyone, any learned writer in Europe in the 15th century, that's Columbus's century, a single one who denies this, who denies the sphericity of the Earth. And that knowledge never disappeared in the Western world. Here's another illustration from Sacrobosco. This one shows the spherical shape of the sea. This is the spherical shape of the element water, just as the earlier one was the spherical shape of the element earth. They were distinguished in Aristotelian thought, but the earth is a sphere, and it's abundantly clear that it is. Sacrobosco's book has, continues to be printed and used in universities up until up to about 1650, so it has a shelf life of 400 years. That's why I say this is like, you know, Try to top that with a science book. And so if you're a medieval university student, you're either, you are taking astronomy in all likelihood, 
Almost every university has one or two astronomy professors. And you're an art student in those days. You don't specialize in stuff. You're probably taking astronomy, at least introductory course. And the textbook for the introductory course is either Sacrobosco or a clone of Sacrobosco. And so you're learning this. I've seen the other textbooks. They all do it the same way. They open with a discussion of the sphericity of the Earth. Now, question for you. Why in the 19th century of all centuries, when Andrew Dixon White and John William Draper are writing, does anybody then let them get away with this crap about this type of an idea? Because this is when art history really becomes an important discipline in many places. And there's countless works of European art that unambiguously show that the Earth is round from before Columbus. I mean, here's an example for you. Here's the West Portal of Westminster Abbey, 13th century. That's a classic theme. If you're an art student or art history student, you know the name of the theme. This is Christ in majesty. This is, this is a, a, a depiction of Jesus with the Byzantine gesture of authority in his right hand. He's not calling for two beers. And then over here in his left hand, he's holding the earth with the cross planted on it. Indeed, this is the orb that is used, the same symbol used in crowning the kings and queens of England. And this is a sphere, again, with a cross planted on it, symbolizing that Christ died for the whole world. That's what it is. And you can see for yourself, this ain't a flat earth. Here's two more pre-Columban works, just as samples here again. I could do the whole lecture on pre-Columban art with this. But here's an image from 14th century France. This is an image of the creation of the earth. And it shows God holding a globe. And here is an image, another version of Christ in majesty. This one by the great Italian Renaissance artist Fra Angelica. Same kind of thing. Now, you'll, I'll give you the fact this is a flat image, OK, but you know, that's round. <laughs> Renaissance artists knew how to do that. So that's what this is. So with all of this kind of imagery all over the place, and of course, these images were the things that were used to educate the ignorant peasants. I'm here not using ignorant as a pejorative. Every one of us is ignorant of something, many things, including everyone in this room, right? starting with me. It's a descriptor. These are people who don't have educations. There's a whole bunch of things they don't know. They're illiterate for the most part. And they go to church and they learn the teachings of the church. And what are they being taught? Well, they're being taught the earth is round right here. So you know, the fact that people thought this was the case in the 19th century, they could believe this story, that medieval people were dumb and thought the earth is flat. That's just kind of unbelievable, isn't it? But there it is. OK, now I've shown you a lot about, about false facts, false facts, alternative facts, if you will, that White presents his audience with. What do historians today say about white? Well, here's just a few examples. First, it is indeed factually challenged. One reason why historians for a long time didn't pick up on this is because white has, shall we say, voluminous footnotes in his work, where he tells you what he's read to get this information. But if you dig down really deep in a lot of these notes, there ain't nothing there when you get to the end of the notes. A famous example that I don't have on one of my slides is an alleged quotation from John Calvin, supposedly from the commentary on the Psalms, dissing Copernicus. Well, Copernicus is never named anywhere in Calvin's writings, including in his sermons. It's a totally manufactured quotation that White gets from another source that didn't go back and look at the original sources. And White had been an expert in Reformation history. You would think, he had this massive personal library. You'd think when he's writing about someone as important as John Calvin, he'd go back and look for himself and put that quotation in context, and then he would not have found it. But there it is. That same quotation is then put in Thomas Kuhn's The Copernican Revolution, one of the most widely selling books ever written in the history of science. It was a textbook of mine in college. It was published in the 50s. It has sold about 800,000 copies. And Kuhn, of course, is probably the most eminent historian of science of the 20th century. And there it is, right in Kuhn. Because Kuhn, that's not Kuhn's specialty. He doesn't write about the history of science and religion. He got it from White. And you know why? Kuhn's not really responsible for digging all the way back, but White should have been. This was right in his, right in his wheelhouse. This came out of early modern European history. Here's what a modern, a recently deceased historian, Colin Russell, a past president of the British Society for History of Science, wrote a number of years ago, Draper takes such liberty with history, perpetuating legends as fact, that he has rightly avoided today. 
in serious historical study. He goes on to say, the same is nearly as true of White, though his prominent apparatus of prolific footnotes may create a misleading impression of meticulous scholarship. That's how, that's how Colin Russell put it. That was right on. I have done a lot of this footnote work myself to find out how bankrupt they are in the end for a particular work I'm doing. Here are two very famous historians, past presidents of the History of Science Society in the United States. The top is David Lindbergh, the late David Lindbergh. He died just a couple of years ago. He was the, probably the preeminent historian of medieval science in America at Wisconsin. And here's his colleague, Ronald Numbers, who's still very much alive. I emailed Ron a few, a few days ago about something. And Ron is a past president not only of the History of Science Society, but also of the American Society of Church History, although Ron is an agnostic, and he makes no secret about that. Um, but he's been past president of the American Society of Church History. They jointly wrote an article about 30 years ago um, in which they said this, okay? It's pr profoundly, oh, that should, that's my typo, sorry. It's profoundly misleading, basically. They say, historical investigation to date has revealed a rich and varied interaction between science and Christianity. This is in the context of an article all about White and Draper, that they're, that they're making this assessment. In other words, White had basically one conceptual box for everything that ever happened in the history of Christianity and science. And that box was warfare. And if it didn't fit, he didn't put it in his book. Or else, he did the Procrustean thing. He took an ax and cut off a lot of parts of it and stuck it in that box to make it fit. Um, that's what they're talking about in context here. Numbers himself in the, has edited this book, which I really recommend to anyone who wants to explore this more fully and get a taste of real history. Galileo goes to jail and other myths about science and religion. Uh, it's from Harvard University Press. It has 25 chapters by 25 authors. All of them we were charged with to write at the level of the New York Times. So a non-expert should be able to, an educated person like everyone in the room, should be able to dive into that book and get something from it. And in the, in the preface to that book, he basically says, historians of science have known for years that White's and Draper's accounts are more propaganda than history. And then finally, Lawrence Principe, who is a distinguished historian of alchemy, <laughs> also an organic chemist. He teaches the organic chemist co chemistry course for pre-meds at Johns Hopkins. Larry Principe is the author of the little tiny book, The Scientific Revolution, a very short introduction. You've probably seen those little books from Oxford, a very short introduction. There's hundreds of them. He wrote the one on the scientific revolution. That's the relevant period of Copernicus and Newton and Vesalius. Here's what Principe says. Many people today acquiesce in the widespread myth devised in the late 19th century, of an epic battle between scientists and religionists. Despite the unfortunate fact that some members of both parties perpetuate the myth by their actions today, and I agree with all of that, this conflict model has been rejected by every modern historian of science. It does not portray the historical situation. That kind of sums it all up. Basically, it's totally unreliable. Those of us who do work in the history of science and religion, that includes, in this case, includes me, those of us who do that know that White and Draper are a reliable source of one thing only, what White and Draper believed. And so you can go back and see that, and you can talk about them. You can historicize them, or you can look in their book for clues to stuff that might be interesting stories to investigate. Um, that's what they're good for. They're really not good for anything else. So. Why does this matter? Why does it matter? Well, I would say this. The warfare view or conflict view is just too easily dragged into culture wars. And we know all about culture wars right now. And even democracy is being threatened in America, the conversation that we're having right now. And in culture wars, some people use it just to dismiss religious ideas from serious consideration. Um, when in fact, this is not tonight's talk, but when in fact, Religion has often been a source of ideas, motivation, and energy in the history of science. So thanks for listening to those comments. <laughs>
Mike says I should field my own questions. So <laughs> let me know if it's going to be a fastball, and I'll get my, get my, my baseball glove out. Yes. There's a growing body of these kinds of things. Uh, one thing I can easily refer you to would be a website that's part of the AAAS in Washington. The AAAS, the American Association of the Advancement of Science. You know, they're the people that publish the journal Science. They have a part of their, part of their uh, organization is called the Directorate on Science, Ethics, and Religion, DOSER, D-O-S-E-R. Not too many years ago, they funded, or they administered rather, administered with private foundation funding, they administered a program on science for seminaries or something to this effect. And they do have some audiovisual resources there that are very, very good on these topics. Um, with one exception, there's like a five or six minute video that Larry Principe and I are in. So you don't want to believe that stuff. But that's actually about the White and Draper stuff, that particular little video that Larry and I are in. But there's, many of them are longer than that. And they're about much more strictly scientific subjects than just this historical kind of subjects. That's a good place to start, I would suggest, is the Doser website. There's a lot of other websites that put information out as well. Um, if you're a Christian, a good place to go and get ideas is Biologos. That's one word, B-I-O-L-O-G-O-S. Um, I've done a lot of columns for Biologos. They're also, they also have a lot of other material on their website. Um, also, uh, the Faraday Institute at Cambridge in England has a lot of material, including some good video material. I don't know if you can download all of the video material they have, though. You might have to buy a DVD uh, to get some of it. There's a terrific three-part DVD called, um, give me a second here. I'm afraid it's not going to come to me right now, that Faraday produces, where the first part is about cosmology, the second part is about evolution, the third part is about neuroscience. And test, test of faith, test of faith is what that's called. And that's a really good resource, so I, I, I recommend that. I say, I don't know if you can stream that. I think you might have to buy a DVD to get that, but the DVD is pretty cheap. Yes? Um, you raised a question, and I, I don't know if you answered it. You, you said, why did people in the 19th century let white get away with this? Yeah. Yeah, so what'd you I, I, that's a rhetorical question. Uh, I, I'm shocked by the idea that Draper and White can push this, can push versions of this flat earth thing, which is really strong in Draper. White has things around the edges of it. Um, White pushes the Magellan piece, for example. I, I just don't understand how, how anybody believed this idea, this popular idea that stays in American textbooks through the 20th century. How could people even believe this, that, that medieval people thought the earth is flat? I mean, not that a few did, you know, but that this is the way Europeans thought about the world, that it's flat. When your evidence is, you know, as I showed you, no educated person in Europe, no university educated person thinks anything otherwise than this. This is what everybody teaches in the universities. So if a student, individual student says, I don't believe it, well, okay, you, know, you can find individual students today who don't believe the earth is round either. But it's, you know, things like that. So everybody knows this is the case. It's established knowledge and unchallenged knowledge. It's unchallenged knowledge. You can't find a single author, European author from the 15th century, who disputes that the earth is round. You can't find them. So it's undisputed knowledge. I wonder, because in the late 1800s, evolution has gained popular knowledge during that period. Is there any possibility that perhaps the context of that conversation is influencing Yes, it can be. Um, that can be part of the picture. But I should point out that in 1869, when White gives that battlefields of science speech at the Cooper Union, there's not a word in there of biological evolution in any way, shape, or form. I'm not even sure what word he would have used 
uh, to refer to it, but the idea is not there, regardless of what word he would have used. You know, because you know Darwin himself, the word evolution is not in the first edition of The Origin of Species. The last word, the very last word in The Origin of Species is evolved, but the word evolution is not anywhere in the book, although in la some of the later editions I think it does appear. Um, those later editions are published up into the 1870s, maybe 80s, but definitely in the, into the 70s, which is after White. But White isn't thinking about evolution at all in 1869. He does bring natural history into it with geology. When he was a young man, he was a student at Yale. And at Yale, uh, the main person for science at Yale in, before the Civil War was Benjamin Silliman. Benjamin Silliman is the first professor of natural history at Yale. He has about a five decade career. And when he teaches geology, he transplants a British geology book, reprints it in New Haven three times, and in the back of each of those versions are his lecture notes for more than 100 pages. So we know what he taught students. He taught students this idea of an ancient universe, an ancient earth. He called the notion progressive creation. He's the first American author I know of who used that term. And he takes a day-age approach to the scriptural text. Um, and that's what he does at Yale. This is from the 18-teens down into the 1850s he's doing this. Now, Silliman, White apparently sat through Silliman's courses, or he at least knew of them, because he references Silliman in the two-volume version of his works. And he, what he picks out is the fact that Silliman did face some religious opposition for teaching what he did at Yale. That's true. Um, and he, so he uses, he uses that fact to kind of say, you know, well, even when someone like Professor Silliman, the revered Professor Silliman at Yale, kind of like stretches the envelope on biblical interpretation in his day, he gets a lot of flack. That's basically what White, what White says in, in my paraphrase of it. So that, that part is reliable. That's true. That's what happened. So he does bring natural history into this, but not evolution. In the last, however, in the, in, the, in the final version, in the two volumes, he does. Evolution is, I believe, it's the last chapter in the book, I think, or else it's the first. It's one of the terminal chapters of the book. Yes? Uh, you say that there wasn't a great conflict between uh, religion and science, uh, and I agree that. When uh, I'll come back to we'll come back to the latter part in a minute, but do I think there have been conflicts, small c, in history of science and religion? I think there have been a number of them. Yes, I do. What I'm rejecting as a historian is the vast conflict narrative, capital C, all large caps, conflict. That's the conceptual box into which the whole history of science and religion must fit. And that's what most of the history of science and religion doesn't fit into. So that, that's, that distinction is what I want to make in response to that part. Now, the second part of your question, could you repeat it and give me a for instance? That's right, he was, for the rest of his life. Yeah. Um, that happened in 1633, and he was at that point, he was born in 1564, so 1633 makes him just about 70 <clears throat> when that happened. That's correct, he's put under a fairly lenient house arrest. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, people can visit him, he's allowed to go to church every week, you know, the church isn't going to deny him going to church every week, and other such things. I mean, he has some personal liberties, but he's, he's basically, they have to know what he's doing. That's basically what it is. But that, I'm not excusing that. I'm explaining what it was. That's correct. He was put under house arrest. As far as we know, he never spent a single day in jail. You know, there, there's about 48 hours when we don't know his whereabouts when he's in Rome during this trial, just about 48-hour period. So is it theoretically possible that he was in jail then? It is. But there's no evidence that he was. And for every other day of the days he was in Rome, we know exactly where he was in terms of his housing. And it wasn't jail. Most of the time, it was in the home of the Tuscan ambassador. 
you, if you remember, in those days, Italy wasn't unified. And Tuscany was a different nation than the Papal States down in Rome. And so they had an ambassador in Rome. That was the ambassador for the Medici family in Rome. And that's where, the, in his home, is where Galileo spent a lot of time during that trial. Yes? Since we're talking about Galileo, I had read, probably in John Lennox, that part of the opposition that Galileo faced from the church was really not strictly based in Christian theology, but rather from the uh, influence of Aristotle on the Catholic Church. Do you think that's true? Um, Aristotle's view of the geocentric universe was, held a lot of sway. It held sway everywhere. I mean, Aristotle's, Aristotle's, was the, Aristotle's view of the universe was the only game in town. Um, I mean, Copernicus had, had published his ideas in 1543, as I say, as he dies. Galileo publishes his famous book, The Starry Messenger, which is the first book with observations of a telescope, in 1610. That's 67 years. In that period of 67 years, people have actually done this count, especially Bob Westman, a great historian at UCLA, or UC San Diego. Th that we have actually counted up the number of people anywhere in the world that we knew were Copernicans, that thought Copernicus was right. In that period, starting with Copernicus, and he's one of them, down to Galileo, and he's another one. It's either a dozen or a baker's dozen. There's, there's, there's one person you can dispute. Um, that's how many people there are anywhere in the world who think Copernicus is right uh, in the conflict, that, in the time when Galileo is, 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 is first getting into these ideas in a public way. And over the course of the 17th century, the acceptance of Copernicanism is still relatively difficult and slow. The reason that is true is there still is, by the end of the 17th century, there still is no proof of the Earth's motion. I mean, even after Newton, there's no proof of the Earth's motion. What I mean by that is, for example, a physicist today would tell you that, well, how do we know the Earth spins on its axis? We'll give one piece of evidence we'll give you is the Coriolis effect. That's from the 19th century. Um, as for going around the sun, the smoking gun for going around the sun could be said to be either the aberration of starlight, which is in the 1740s, or more commonly, the discovery of stellar parallax in 1838. And stellar parallax was the smoking gun for Galileo. Everybody was looking for it. You know, basically, this is the idea for those of you who, let's, I need to bring the rest of the people into this conversation. If the Earth goes around the sun, then over the course of a year, it's hundreds, you know, it's nearly 200 million miles away in January than it was in July. And so if you sight stars through telescopes with very, very fine pointing devices and crosshairs and such, you in principle should be able to determine slight differences in the angles at which these stars are visible in January and in July. It's a real effect. It requires really sophisticated mountings for the scopes, very fine optics, um, you know, spider uh, silk crosshairs and statistics. And those pieces of technology aren't all in place until the 19th century, where they can really begin to see this. Um, and so nobody in, in Newton's day even could see stellar parallax. And even Ole Raymer, the great a Danish astronomer from the 1670s who calculates for the first time a, a sort of reliable number for the speed of light. He does this by delays in the expected times of the eclipses of the moons of Jupiter. Okay, that's how he figures this out. He calculates a rough number for the speed of light that's just not really close to our modern number, but at least it's in the ballpark. And he doesn't believe the Earth moves around the sun. He's a disciple of Tycho Brahe, who was the great, in my opinion, the greatest observational astronomer in all of history. He, he comes a generation after Copernicus, and he is totally convinced that stellar parallax cannot be seen by anyone in the world. He knows he's the best observer. It really is true that quantitatively and qualitatively, no one in the history of astronomy to that point was even remotely close to Tycho Brahe. He publishes in his lifetime more observations of the heavens than all the rest of observations ever published down to his time by a factor of two or three. So he's not only publishing everything, his precision of his observations is incredible. He can even tell you, at that time, in the 1500s, he can even tell you the atmospheric effect of cold air in northern Europe on observations in the winter and how much it's going to cause a stellar star's position to deviate by as you look at it. I mean, this guy is really good 
and he can't see stellar parallax. So the Earth doesn't move. He knows the Earth doesn't move for this kind of reason. So the conversation in the 17th century has this background. Every single thing Galileo sees is consistent with Tycho Brahe's theory of the universe, which is not the, which is not the Copernican view, but it's not the Ptolemaic view either. He puts the Earth in the center at rest, the sun going around the Earth, and all the planets going then around the sun. And that's actually a mathematical equivalent, not a physical equivalent, of Copernicus. So everything that Copernicus, that Galileo sees, is consistent with Tycho. And it doesn't have, as Galileo even says, the inconvenience of putting the Earth in motion, by which Galileo means the inconsistency. He means the inconsistency with what you actually see with your senses. Galileo even says, in his famous dialogue on two world systems, that he has great admiration for those who have done such violence to their senses as to believe the Copernican system. That's what he says. And so, you know, this is still a hot issue in the 17th century. There is no evidence of the Earth's motion. So the church wants proof before they're going to change their interpretation of scripture. They want proof, and they don't have it. Galileo can't produce it. So that, that's part of the story. It's part of the story, yeah. The Aristotelian system is part of the story, but it's not simply that the church adopts the, the Aristotelian system. Everybody else does, too. That's what the universities are teaching all over the place. Just like the Islamic astronomers had, had adopted Aristotle as well, you know, in another cultural context. Yes? So uh, just as we talk through all of this, what do you see uh, moving forward look like? How should we respond to this, I suppose, individually and then also as the church? That's a good question. I, I guess I think about it often, <laughs> so I ought to have a good answer for you. <laughs> I, think, I think in the 21st century, in many American churches, there has been a great reaction to science reactionary response and primarily I won't say unthinking because some of the people who have made these responses are thoughtful people a response out of fear a response out of fear rather than a response out of uh, thoughtful reflection I'll put it that way uh, and indeed a lot of that started right here at VPI do you know who I refer to? Who do I refer to? Some of the older people in the room. Who am I referring to? Henry I am. I am. Tell the group who Henry Morris was. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Morris was at one point, I think the chair, right, of the Department of Hydraulic Engineering here at BPI. Is there such a was there such a department then? Yeah. Context is 1950s and then into the 60s. And he, together with John C. Whitcomb, Jr., a theologian and biblical scholar from Indiana, from a seminary out there, authored a book called The Genesis Flood. Now, I'm curious, how many people have heard of that book? Okay. The Genesis Flood. 1961 is the publication date. It has been accurately, in my view, described by many people as the Bible of scientific creationism. This is the book that really launches the modern creation movement back in 61. And it begins to take, get traction in the 70s and 80s around the country. Um, Morris, you know, is, is, is convinced that if his interpretation of the biblical text in Genesis is not correct, then Christianity is false. And Morris, is, Morris believes the earth is six to 10,000 years old. Um, the days of creation were literal days. All of creation was accomplished in the space of six days. And any evidence to the contrary either is a misinterpretation of the evidence from nature or is an inference from what Morris believed, the fact that the earth was created in some respects with apparent age. Morris actually believed that and pushed that in his book, The Genesis Flood. Contemporary creationists try to not to play that card about apparent age as much as they can not play it. But Morris played it pretty often. And, and so you know, if, if the universe looked as though at that time, what would it have been? Well, I don't know. The age of the universe in 1960, I don't know what that would have been. 
Um, at the turn of the century, it was 100 million years, around 1900. And then it keeps getting bigger and bigger in the 20th century, and then it backs off again <laughs> more recently. Um, but whatever that number would have been, um, you know, that, that people who are inferring that are failing to consider the fact that God could have created things to make, look, to make them look a lot older than they are. That's related to the very famous and true issue from the 19th century of whether Adam and Eve had navels. There actually is a writer in the mid-19th century who takes up that topic, and a British marine biologist named Goss, G-O-S-S-E, takes up the issue of whether Adam and Eve are created with a parent age. So that, that, that's related to that. But I think it's a reaction of fear. Now, partly, partly, in my view, partly because around 1960, once again, evolution is in the center of high school biology books as the organizing principle. That was not true in 1950. It was not true in 1940. It was becoming less and less true in 1930. Um, the Scopes trial of 1925 was in, to a significant degree, not, not anywhere near 100%, but to a significant degree was a reaction to the fact that that period of time, the late 19th to early 20th century, there's a great expansion in the availability of public education so that it's virtually universal. And at the same time, evolution is front and center in the biology books as the organizing principle. And in the early 20th century, the way it's presented to readers is in a very highly secular way. In the 19th century, evolution was typically presented with a religious gloss in, 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 in natural history textbooks. And so that changes around the turn of the century. So you have, for the first time, universal public education and the books being used for that present evolution in opposition to religious notions, really, dismissively or just leaving them entirely out, you know, and as if they have no, no consequence for anyone. And so that evolution becomes seen as highly anti-religious at that time. And on top of that, back then, Evolution really was very closely tied both to eugenics and scientific racism. That, that's just a fact, historical fact, in the United States. For example, the textbook that gets contested in Dayton, Tennessee at the Scopes trial, A Civic Biology by James, I think it's James Hunter. Hunter is the surname of the author, is full of those things, full of eugenics and scientific racism. And when Brian gets going in 1922 on his anti-evolution crusade, the AAAS is very worried about this for public opinion, and they form a three-man committee to combat this. And here's the three people. Charles Davenport, who's head of the Cold Spring Harbor Eugenics Lab. He's, he's, he's um, also a scientific racist as well as eugenicist. Second person is Henry Fairfield Osborne. He was the curator of the American Museum of Natural History in New York and a Princeton professor. He's a eugenicist and a scientific racist. And the third person is Edwin Grant Conklin, who becomes one of the leading public intellectuals in America. He's on the, time, he's on the cover of Time magazine in the late 1930s. He writes these really beautifully written essays about science and democracy, science and religion, history of science as he sees it, and things of that nature. Conklin is a eugenicist and scientific racist. In fact, if you go to some um, white supremacy sites today, you'll find them often quoting Edwin Grant Conklin. So that's the response the AAAS makes to Brian's efforts to stop the teaching of evolution with public money. Brian doesn't want to touch anything done in a private institution. He believes in freedom of speech in that sense. But he doesn't want government money used to fund the teaching of evolution at any level, including university. So when, this, when the, the, act, the Butler Act is passed in 1925, uh, the spring of 1925, it forbids the teaching of human evolution at every publicly funded school, including the University of Tennessee. So that's how that actually goes. Now that's a long way of getting to this, but there was that story is similar in terms of the biology textbooks and the perceived anti-religious nature of them in 1960, right before this Whitcomb Morris book is actually published. That's going on. And of course, in the 60s, you have huge culture wars in America. You do. 
over the Vietnam War, over uh, segregation and integration, over um, the so-called so -called recreational drugs. You even have a Harvard professor, Timothy Leary, advising students to tune in and drop out by taking LSD. And, and you have, you have um, um, the sexual revolution going on, Woodstock symbolizing a lot of that. And, and so this, there's great social unrest. Things are changing very quickly. People are, who don't want to go with that are looking for places to put down solid anchors. And here comes Henry Morris and John Whitcomb telling them, yeah, you can believe a literal Bible. They mean by that what they mean. You can believe a literal Bible, and you can still, ex still be fully scientific in doing that. So you know, I think it's a reaction primarily of fear. And if you go today to Answers in Genesis, uh, probably the leading anti-evolution website, that's the one that is operated by Ken Ham, whose organization owns the Creation Museum and the Ark Museum in Kentucky. You can look, look carefully at how they approach issues, and you can see how a fear is motivating a great deal of what they do. It's a fear of loss of religious faith on the part of youth and adult Christians. And so they will tell you the motto of their, their organization on the masthead of their website is upholding the truth of Genesis from the very first verse. And so it's an apologetics site. And they take the Morris Whitcomb type of approach and make it you know, web friendly and, and put it out there to what must be a worldwide audience in the millions um, for, for their particular set of ideas. But it's fear of what evolution will do, socially, morally, and religiously. It's the same kind of fear that William Jennings Bryan had. The only difference I see in there in the two approaches is that Bryan never had any questions about the age of the earth. Um, he wasn't interested in that question. He once said he's much more interested in the, in the rock of ages than the ages of rocks. But he, was, he was, had no objection at all to a universe and an earth that are as old as the scientists want to say they are. That's also true of every single leader of, what, of the movement that called themselves fundamentalists in the 1920s. Every single fundamentalist leader thought the earth was really old, every single one. Um, they had ways of dealing with that that Ken Ham thinks were totally illegitimate. Um, and so today's type of anti-science position among, held by many Christians is even more profoundly anti-scientific than was Brian's. I don't think Brian would have had a problem at all with the Big Bang, for example, if he had lived to see it. Um, but certainly that's rejected as atheism even by, by Ken Ham's organization. I think it's fear. It's fear, fear about these kinds of things that it might lead to. Yeah. One more. Yes, one more? OK. Right. So what do you think is the role of religion in science? What do I think is the, say it again, please? In scientific progress. Science. In science. science. Come tomorrow to my lecture tomorrow. Where's the details on that? Yeah, I guess I'll, that's a great, that's a great <laughs> opportunity. So tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. in Lytton Reeves, 1860, Dr. Davis is going to give a lecture which we, he calls Why Christianity is Good for Science. We've characterized, we're, we're calling it Is Christianity Good for Science? Because he's going to speak for about 20 minutes, and then Dr. Matthew Goodroom, who's a professor of, of science and technology and society here at Virginia Tech is going to provide a response and we'll have a dialogue between him and Dr. Goodrum. So that's going to be really interesting. I hope you'll be able to make it. That's tomorrow at 1.30 in Lytton Reeves, 1860. Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, if you have a chance to write uh, your card out. Um, I do want to actually make a two-minute report. Oh, okay. All right. Now, now that he's announced it. <laughs> um, please, on your way out, please um, fill out the cards and drop them. And hold on one second for two minutes. And, and Dr. Davis. I don't think that, for example, the Bible as a, as a text is, is a scientific source at all. I don't think that, 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 that in most cases in the history of science, for example, even the most devout Christian scientists who might quote the Bible a lot in other kinds of writings they're not quoting the Bible except in trivial ways in their scientific publications. Now that's true right down into the 19th century when you really do find a more profound secularization. But Newton, Boyle, uh, Galileo, 
Um, they're not quoting the Bible in their scientific work. They're not. They don't see it as relevant to their laboratory work. And like this text relates to that. So that's not the kind of influence I would look for. The kind of influences I look for are metaphysical. And so what are the metaphysical foundations of science? And to what extent do theological propositions relate to those? I will have quite a bit to say about that tomorrow. And in some of my, some of my writings on 17th century science, I have things to say about that. And I'd be happy to, to email you uh, some of those papers uh, where I talk about things like that. My own dissertation was done on under um, the great Newton scholar Richard Westfall, who wrote the definitive biography with Cambridge. And my, my, my work was partly on Newton, partly on Boyle, partly on Galileo, partly on Rene Descartes. And my argument was that certain types of Christian theology in the 17th century were indeed influential on the notions of scientific knowledge, what it is and how we obtain it and what it's for. That's where the influence comes. And those are philosophical, metaphysical questions. They're not strictly speaking scientific questions, even though many scientists are interested in those questions. So that's, that's the short answer, and I'll give a bigger answer tomorrow. Would you join me in thanking Dr. Davis? <laughs>